guys, I share commands for you today in Raid Shadow Legends. Today is going to be a good video, guys, because we want to talk about the best ally attack epic inside the entire game. Bar none, it is Farrakhan the Fat, the Fat Man. Before we jump into his kit and what makes him so good, let's go ahead and give a few shout outs here. We have Hunter Dragon. Why not Farrakhan the Fat, bro? Well, dude, we have it today, man. We have it today. Let's go on to Mienta Goretta. Man, I'm just as bad as real, with real life names as I am with Raid Shadow Legends champion names, wouldn't you know? Uh, Maitena Goretta. Could you do Farrakhan the Fat, please? Yes, I absolutely can. Uh, Hunter Dragon again. Magnolia Torres. Question, can you do Farrakhan the Fat? Build, guide, or Venomage? Venomage we can do soon. Ghostly Scrub. I see all my shards and I pulled the Fat Man. Can you do a guide on him? Absolutely. Separate my rat. Fat Man, you got it. Nectar, Nectar Tash. I saw the ash in my eyes zero in. Fat Man, Ryan, Fat Man, Commander Tube, Farrakh and the Fat, you got it, you got it, guys. Here he is. In all his glory, he is the Fat Man. He's really, really good on his A1. It's a sizzling strike. Attacks one enemy. He's got a 50% chance when but to play some decreased defense. On his A2, Brand of Shame. On a three-turn cooldown, attacks one enemy. Has a 100% chance of placing an HP burn. And two poison debuffs for two turns. So we get one burn, two poisons, three-turn cooldown. He's bringing some nice damage, especially against bosses with this A2. It makes him super viable in a uh, demon lord clan boss and against really any boss out there his multipliers are not bad uh, but really, it's the uh, it's the burns and the poison and, of course, the ally attack. His ally attack beatdown is increased crit rate, increased crit damage on all allies for three, count them three turns on a four-turn cooldown. Then, all allies except this champion will attack one target enemy. So because he's not joining the attack and because his multipliers are not insane, we don't care so much about building him with 100% crit rate and a lot of crit damage on this champion. It's all about building him with a lot of speed and some accuracy because we'd love to take advantage, especially in PvE, of his decreased defense and his burns and his poison now in pvp in the arena on like a blender comp which we'll show you today uh you can get away with not even building accuracy because if he does his job right if the team is constructed properly well then in most cases you'll just be winning in a matter of seconds utilizing the beatdown strategy or the beatdown ability excuse me <laughs> beatdown strategy too right uh body block deflects 20 percent of the incoming damage the champion receives onto all allies this champion will spread the equally across all allies so you know what that's not a bad little bit ability there. He's got that damage mitigation built right in. His defense is actually pretty healthy at almost 1,100 for an epic attack-based champion. His attack is all right at 1,200. His HP is a bit low at 14.5, but we can work with that. We can definitely bolster that up uh, utilizing our accessories, right, for extra HP. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at how I have him built here. Uh, but on the A3, I think it's important to note, like, right out the gate here, on the A3 ally attack, right? First of all, there's not that many ally attackers out there in the entire game, right? Ally attack is an amazing ability, especially against Eternal Dragon, against Fire Knight, because more hits on that shield, right? Uh, ally attack on a Blender Comp, ally attack against Eternal Dragon, uh, ally attack against Griffin. Did I ever say that? Either way, ally attack is a great ability pretty much all over the place. It's funny, Plarium in the last like two and a half years, three years, they moved away, obviously, still only three champions in the game with an AoE counterattack. Instead, they gave ally attack they introduced ally attack into the game and since then there's been quite a few champions added with it the thing to know about ally attack and a lot of new players don't recognize this uh early on is that their default skills of all of your allies it only deals 75 percent of the normal damage on an ally attack so the cool thing about it on his kid is that we have that extra crit damage and the extra crit rate, which allows us to build the other champions on the team with maybe even 70% crit rate and just go attack percentage on their boots because speed doesn't really matter either. As a matter of fact, I'm going to upload a video, I think in a day or two on my main YouTube channel, Ash Raid Shadow Legends, uh, talking about the new age, the new era of blenders. And Farrakh and the Fat is actually on that team as well as the ally attacker. I think I only like Longbeard better than Farrakh and the Fat for, an, for a blender comp in the game. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and get to the champion here, Ash. Stop rambling to the people, man. With no lore on the fat man. I would love to hear some lore. I want to know what the backstory of the fat man is, you know? Uh, but either way, we have him, no surprise, in a triple speed set. Let's take a look at his total stats to kick things off here. 275 on the speed. 
Speed is our first priority on this champion. Accuracy is going to be our second priority on this champion. And then some survivability, depending on where you're using him. You can get away with less survivability if you're using him in the arena, because again, it's going to go fast. It's going to go A3, everybody's dead, right? And the only champion you need to have fast in a blender comp, if things go according to plan, of course, is the ally attacker, right? We can get away with putting our Sineshes, our Skull Crowns, our Rays, as we're going to show in today's video, with attack percentage on their boots and make them a lot slower than we would a typical nuker because again, we're going to go at the speed of Ferric in the fat, right? What makes a good blender comp champion to go, uh, you know, alongside him? Obviously, it's going to be somebody with an AOE on their A1. We'll get, we'll talk about that in, in how to order those champions in just a moment we jump into the arena. So again, 275, 273 on the accuracy. That's going to be enough to be landing his debuffs where I'm using him in the game, which is Doom Tower Hard. I'll show you that team as well. All right, so on the accessories. We have accuracy on the banner. If you don't care about landing those debuffs, you're using him strictly in a blender, I think mean, you can get away with just some, some HP on the blender, maybe a little bit of extra speed. But you know what? Accuracy is always kind of good because if you don't kill him on the first shot, it's nice to still have those burns in the uh, and the poison. HP on the amulet. And then we have HP again on the ring. Again, a lot of survivability. I love building the weaker of defense and HP. Whatever scales worse... I like focusing on that stat in our accessories, right? Because percentage base, we want to stick with defense, but flat stat, we want to stick with HP. So we do have resistance on the chest. That is only because I wanted to run triple speed on this champion. You can definitely go ahead and utilize uh, just triple perception or a mixed match of perception and speed or divine speed on this champion. It's all about the speed, but getting that extra accuracy is not bad either. The resist is not instrumental or imperative to this kit or this build. I just happen to have an uh, available chess piece uh, with uh, a speed roll on it and accuracy. So let me actually see if I can... Uh, yeah, I can use an accuracy glyph. I don't want to waste one of my six-star or five-star speed glyphs on a champion that I don't use a ton right now. Uh, or a resist piece that I don't really have a big need for outside of this. Anyway, as I mentioned, guys, defense percentage on the gauntlets makes a lot of sense on this champion. I have seen people build him with a little bit of crit rate, especially if they're trying to like min-max the damage on a clan boss team. Uh, but that would, for me, that would be like the only exception. That would be the only way I would crit cap... Crit cap blah, 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 blah. Crit cap him at 100%, right, uh, for, for Demon Lord. Outside of that, I wouldn't worry about his crit rate and his crit damage at all, uh, nor would I really focus or worry about his attack. But for, for a clan boss, just to be very clear about it, I would go accuracy on the banner. I would go with attack percentage, probably if I can keep him alive, depending on the team I had him on with, on the chest, and I would go with crit rate on the gauntlets there, if, again, I could keep him alive. For blessings on this champion, guys, uh, we want Phantom Touch, right? Getting that extra damage off Phantom Touch is totally cool. Uh, I'll take it. It will help us out in the Doom Tower areas that we use this champion as well. Uh, other options, obviously, you could go with Commanding Presence on this champion. I think that's a, a wise way to go. Strengthen your team's aura if you have no other aura strengthener on your team. And if you're concerned with him getting CC'd, uh, of course, going with Dark Resolve is an option as well. Uh, talking about masteries on this champion, the cool thing is, I'm going to be real with you guys, you can actually get by on this champion without doing any masteries uh, on him, right? Uh, I would, let me see on his books really quickly here. If you're using him just for the arena, honestly, you could get by without booking him as well, right? Like, all you want to do is build him fast and get to this ability. He does it, frankly... You could get by, depending on where you are in your account and stuff, with him at level 50, unbooked, no masteries. Because you just need him to be fast to go with beatdown. That's really it, right? The cooldown is nice to have, especially in longer PvE battles. But he's definitely a champion you can utilize, even like on a free-to-play account, without having to go all in on the investment, which is super nice on this champ. So we have support tree. Just got a little bit extra HP. As I mentioned, he's pretty weak on the HP. So we went down. We did pick up a little bit of accuracy on the way as well. Lore of Steel, obviously, is going to be a huge benefit to this champion, the way we have him built in a triple speed set. Uh, and then we went Master Hexer and Sniper as well. Uh, offense side of things, we just went right down the left-hand side to uh, War Master. Now, I do have Cycle of Violence, you'll notice here. Uh, hmm. I don't think that makes any sense on this champion. It's going to be real with you guys. Can I can I reset? Nah, I don't want to pay the gems to reset. Ah, you ever do that? You ever see a mastery that you're like, ah, I don't know about that, but it's not like super imperative uh, because he's not going to be doing 30% of damage against really anybody, right? It's inflicted by the skill. 
not inflicted by the ally attacks, by the other allies on the team, right? So keep that in mind. Cycle of Violence is a great ability, but not on this particular build of this champion. I think it would be smarter just to go with, honestly, Evil Eye. I would probably just go Evil Eye instead, uh, or even going with Cycle of Magic. Cycle of Magic, 5% chance of decreasing the cooldown of a random skill by one turn at the start of each turn, is, it doesn't sound very sexy, a 5% sounds so small, but you'd be surprised over the duration of longer fights, how often, like Hydra, for example, I'm not saying for this particular champion or build, but you'd be surprised at longer battle on Hydra, especially consider cycle of magic or, you know, uh, just be careful on demon Lord because it could screw up your, uh, your speed tuning. Right. Uh, okay. We've talked about his, his bill. We talked about his blessings. We talked about his stat priorities. Let's go ahead. I'm dying to give this guy a shot. Let's go right inside the arena here. Right. So, uh, let's just go against kind of the first team that we see that doesn't have Hegemon. So we have Arbiter, we have Ray, we have Skullcrown, we have Ferric and the Fat. Now it's very important. The order of which champion, where, how these champions appear on this team is super important, right? The, on an ally attack team, they're going to go in positional order. So Arbiter is going to go first when, when the ally attack goes off, when the A3 of Ferric goes off. Arbiter is going to go first. Ray is going to go second. Skullcrown is going to go third, okay? If we swapped it to where it was like this, Skullcrown would go before Ray. Why is that important? Because on A on Ray's A1, attacks all enemies, we have a 50% chance of placing a decreased defense. Ideally, we'd like that debuff up there before Skullcrown goes, right? Now, in this particular use case, uh, Skullcrown also has an ability on the A1, place an extra hit if the target has more than 50% HP. So you could also make the case, wait a second, what if we go with Skullcrown first? And she gets that extra hit because they're more likely to have more than 50% HP uh, if she goes before Ray, And then Ray goes in with the AoE on the A1, right? So we can try it both ways and just kind of see. But uh, anyway, that's how it works. That's why the, the rotation is so important. Now, you can run a Blender Comp without an Arbiter. But it's nice to have that speed lead. You just need to make sure that Ferric and the Fat is within 30% speed of your speed booster. In this case, Arbiter. So we're going to go ahead and go in. Uh, it doesn't really matter, you know, necessarily who we attack because anyway, we're all coming in with the AOEs and, and that's really it, right? That That's it. Now we can come back in for another turn and it's done. This is why this is still the fastest strategy. Wait a second. Why is it showing me Pytheon having no artifacts? What in the world? That's weird, huh? All right. Well, we'll put some boots on you later, man. That is odd <laughs> anyway here we go guys uh but you guys will see like this is the amazingness of ferric and the fat boom 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 dead everybody oh wait, there we go there we go they do have a stupid cardinal on their team i didn't even see her over there but it's okay we can just chill she'll revive everybody they'll have a full turn meter shame on you and we might die because they're gonna get, be guaranteed to go next one two and here he comes ouch ouch Oh, we have a skull crown still alive. Oh, you love to see it. You love to see it. <laughs> Let's watch one more. I'll tell you what, guys. I could look at a blender comp all day, man. I just, there's something fun about it, isn't it? Is it just me? <laughs> I don't know. Here we go. Bump, bump, and toast. That's pretty nice. You know what I'm going to do, guys? I'm actually going to purposely lose this one. I'm going to switch the order and just take a look at the damage differential, you know? Uh, on a lot, of, sometimes it's going to be super obvious, like Sinesha and, and Skullcrown. You want to have Skullcrown going first because Sinesha is going to hit it, place an extra hit if they're lower than 50% HP, right? But on this one, I think it, we got to trial and error a little bit, right? So here we go. Now Ray's going to go first. Could barely even tell there. Okay. Let's do that. And then let's do, so I liked it better, super anecdotal, but I kind of liked it better with, with Skullcrown going first. Anyway, here we go in with the Banish, and everybody's toast either way. So yeah, there it is, guys. A blender comp with Ferric and the Fat, you gotta love it. You really got to love it. All right, let me show you the Doom Tower uh, one. Uh, as I mentioned, I use him against Eternal Dragon and against uh, uh, Griffin. Do I have him here? No. Do I have him against Eternal setup? Nope. Do I have him against Magma set up right now? <laughs> Man, I gotta prepare for these videos better. I do. So you know what? I, as you can see, though, on those three teams, I'm using Longbeard, 
cardio and uh, ferric in the fat, that should tell you one thing, right? I'm a big, big fan of ally attack teams. And truthfully, we could use Ferric in the Fat against Eternal Dragon easy and easily enough anyway. He has a strong affinity against Magma Dragon as well, so that helps. I have it. This team is not speed tuned. It's not on any AI. There's nothing about this team that's that's uh, you know, <laughs> it's perfectly catered towards the level. This is Doom Tower Hard, by the way. Uh, I'm going to come back to you and meet. Nah, I can just chill with you guys for a bit. Who cares, right? Would you like to see me? I thought about this channel. Let me just chat with you guys for a little bit here. I thought about on this channel uh, doing like theme weeks, you know, like all Force Affinity champions, all Force Affinity nukers, all ally attackers, all ally protectors, you know, all provokers. Uh, I could just keep going and going. All campaign farmable champions, you know, just to give like some sort of a... I don't know, the uh, predictability or a series component to the uh, to the channel here. I'm really loving the channel. Hopefully you guys are as well. I, I only mentioned this one time. Uh, I promise this week. This is the only time. Uh, but thank you so much for supporting Aura. Uh, I have like 26 or so of you guys signed up for that security service. Uh, it's been really cool because it's my first channel sponsor here on this channel or the Raid channel. And it's really, really cool to get so many of you guys uh, responding. And it definitely helps me out. And the client is super thrilled with everything. So uh, thank you so much. It's basically an online VPN and cybersecurity, everything. You know, uh, I, the link is in the description below if you guys want to check it out. And I promise I won't bother with you uh, bother you with it again. This is not a paid uh, promotion, but it is a channel partner. So I guess technically it, it is. Uh, disclosure, FTC. Uh, anyway, guys. It's not a contractually paid promotion. I'm just out of the kindness of my heart thanking you guys. So you guys, you can see the strategy with this team, right? It's simple. Uh, keep the Magma Dragon provoked and just hammer away, right? The nice thing is, is we do bring decreased defense on that A1 as well. So if we didn't have a Stagnite or a Fenax on the team, we would still have that chance of landing on the A1. You can still, he's, you can see he's still bringing the damage with the poisons, right? He's bringing the poisons uh, on his A2 ability. And again here, it's just, it's a fairly easy fight. The beautiful thing about Fenax as a partner, a tandem partner that you want to definitely use with Ferric and the Fat, both in the arena and anywhere else is because A, Fenex has a deny revival on his A1, so it's really effective in the arena. It's really effective uh, against uh, uh, minions of bosses as well. And also, he has one of the hardest ha hitting A1s in the game. I think he's like fourth or so, third or fourth. I think only Kandrophon comes to mind in terms of an A1 that is stronger than Fenex's, and he's an he's a uh, epic champion. And then thirdly, uh, he is both. They're both spirit affinity, so they have like that same uh, affinity synergy so to speak. So you can bring them in against, you know, force affinity uh, mobs like the Magma Dragon here. Or if you're going against a, Pythi a bunch of Pythons, making a second mention of the video here, uh, in the arena or something like that, you know, Mighty Uko, uh, you can go with like a really cool uh, a spirit affinity team, right? You could even put in like a, I don't know, who else could we put in there? Uh, you know who has a really hard hitting A1 uh, and is also very annoying in the arena and it can also smack uh, none other than, Hef uh, not Hefrak, uh, Helicath. So you can make like a really cool spirit only affinity team and have that really nice synergy all together. So again, it's not the fastest run known to man here, but it's super dependable. And this Magma Dragon hits incredibly hard, but that's the beautiful thing about Warchief on this team. I thought about doing a Warchief guy today, actually. Uh, and then I kind of was just like, yeah, I don't know, man. Like he's the most basic champion in the history of the game. Build him with some accuracy and that's it. <laughs> I mean, that's it. He's provoking on, on, on both of his abilities, right? Uh, so... Here we go. Maybe I could do one because there are there are the blessings and the masteries and stuff on War Chief. So maybe we we'll, we will do War Chief before this Doom Tower rotation is over because this is really where he shines against the Magma Dragon. So Magma Dragon man, he's doing his thing. We don't really need War Chief and uh uh what's his face uh Bivald of the Thorn on this team. You can see those ally attacks certainly certainly helpful, right? Slow and sure, just slowly but surely, we're taking this dragon down. And that is the power, again, of having an ally attack champion. You could even run multi-ally attack champions on the same team against in any of these dungeons. So in, in, in place of, uh, of uh, what's his face? Dude, I just said his name. What the heck? Why do I have such a problem thinking of uh, <laughs> this dude, man? Bybald of the Thorn. Jesus, man. Uh, in place of Bybald of the Thorn. 
we could run a Krila if we had one, a, a Longbeard if we had one. I guess uh, Lanicus the Chosen, now that I think of it, there's a lot of magic affinity there, right? We could run a Cardial if we're lucky enough to have him, right? So, uh, you know, running an, a, even a Necrit the Great, you know, they all do very, very well against all these kind of, I want to say less challenging Doom Tower bosses. I'm sure you guys can agree with that, right? Like the Eternal Dragon, the or the Griffin, the Dragon, uh, the Magma Dragon as well. I feel like they're all quite a bit easier than some of like the Bombles of the world. Uh, but anyway, guys, you guys can see here that Farrakhan, I mean, he held his own. Bival put out 1.7 million, but Farrakhan did great. I mean, he outdamaged Stagnite. He kind of hung up, uh, hung in there with Fenax as well. I guess one final thing to note, guys, before we uh, conclude the video here, is that Farrakhan against Magma might not be the best choice for an ally attacker. Obviously, it's not really holding us up. We're still going to do great with it, obviously, as you saw on this team. Uh, but keep in mind, those HP burns on the Magma Dragon, they're going to be replaced with Continuous Heals. And as we've already mentioned here, uh, Farrakhan does have that burn on his A2 ability. So that's just something to watch out for there. I did not really notice... Uh, any burns land or any con many continuous heals landing on the magma dragon through that battle, but I must have missed them. Either way, though, it's not going to make a massive difference. What you could also do is just shut off this A2 ability against the magma dragon and just go ahead and hammer away with the decreased defense and get to that A3. Alternatively, if you are really going to try to use him and optimize him for the magma dragon, you could shut off the A2, put him in reflex gear. And then he'll get back to the A3 a lot quicker and get more ally attacks. I think that would probably be the best way to tackle specifically the Magma Dragon. And but that's really only if you don't have any other ally attackers, uh, or if you're really just trying to struggling to beat him for the very first time or something like that, you know. Uh, but other than that, you can still get by with a burn. But I just figured I'd mention that. Good to know before you start bringing in like a Drekstar Blood Twin or whatever that you really generally do not want burners against the Magma Dragon, guys. With that, that is going to do it for the video. Thank you so much for watching and. Uh, as always, take care, guys.